Um, so welcome to Green Beverly's uh, first pollinator event. So a huge thank you to the library and Graham. Thank you, Graham. <laughs> and um, Beth Cam is actually videotaping, so we'll be able to have this for posterity. Thank you, Beth Cam. So we're going to post this um, once they're done with it on the Green Beverly Pollinator webpage. So it'll be there for you as a reference as well, which will be super helpful because these ladies over here have so much great information. We'll be referencing it again and again. So um, my name is Shelley Lee. I am the Director of Programming at Green Beverly. And as you know, today we're pre pretending it is spring. Um, so I tried to dress appropriately. I even put sandals on to really get the feeling going. Um, but it's not exactly spring outside. I think we have about 10 more days and then, you know, at least they say it's spring. So how many of you have been to a Green Beverly event before? Awesome. It's a great combination of not and have been. So fabulous. Um, so a few things of housekeeping. I already mentioned the registration and so that you can win raffles. We're going to announce the raffle winners at the very end, of course, to keep you all tiered to the very end. And I'm going to say, unless you know you have some really pressing reason, reason that you know to win, you should be here. Um, and if you've registered, and uh, I have 50 seed packets to give away, and I don't think we've hit 50 people, so everybody should be able to take some seeds home. Um, so and just a. Uh, I want to tell you about Green Beverly, since some of you don't know, it's a nonprofit that was started in 2021. Green Beverly's mission is to help businesses and residents live more sustainably in Beverly, hence the Green Beverly. Um, to that end, I just wanted to tell you about some of the things that we're doing in Beverly. Um, we have coaches that can answer your questions. Rosemary, I mean, one of you are coaches, right? Yeah, Rosemary's a coach. So we have coaches for solar panels, EV cars, composting, um, how to minimize your trash. We have a lot of options, and it's on our website. You can just click on the button, ask a coach. Um, we're running a few food rescue program. We're rescuing food from three supermarkets every week and getting it to people in need here in Beverly. I'm actually running that. I'm always looking for volunteers, so come talk with me afterwards if you want to join us. Um, we have a grant with the US State, USDA to study how to grow more food on the North Shore. We're kicking off a program that's going to be an incentive program if you buy an EV in the next year or so. We're working with the city to get real estate owners, especially landlords, to have their properties audited for energy efficiency upgrades. And we're running a lot of events in Beverly. If you've been to Pumpkin Smash every uh, fall, the first Saturday of November, we are smashing pumpkins in wild and crazy ways with trebuchets and all sorts of things, and then composting them. Um, and then we're going to be running a whole bunch of Earth Spring events, we're calling it. So you know, there's Earth Day. We're going to be running some little events all during April and May. So take a look at our website and our calendar so that you can see what's happening. Uh, and specifically, if you're a landlord or you're interested in buying an EV car, come and talk with me at the end just so I can get you the hot scoop. But the other thing that we're doing are pollinators. So today, as you know, is all about pollinators. So this is as a result of a generous grant that we got from Cell Signaling Technology. And we're hosting this educational event today. And then we're actually giving out plants in spring, and I'll tell you more about that at the end. So it's generous, and it's um, cell signaling technology that's making this possible. So without further ado, we have two speakers. We have Cheryl from Plant Magic, woohoo, and we have Rosemary Mulphy from, I think I'm gonna try and say this right, Xerxes, is that right? Got I did it, okay. <laughs> the Xerxes Society for Invertebrate Conservation. That's a handful. Yeah. And she's a pesticide program specialist. So without further ado, ladies, take it away, okay? All right. Hi, everybody. I apologize for people who can't see me over the computer. Uh, I am short. <laughs> all right. Uh, so I want to uh, thank you all for being here today. I want to thank Green Beverly and also the Beverly Library uh, for hosting this event. I never pass up a chance to talk about bees, so thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> My name is Rosemary Malfi. I work for the Xerxes Society for Invertebrate Conservation. We are a nonprofit that uses science-driven methods to conserve invertebrates and the habitats that they rely on. I'm also a bee ecologist and have been for quite some time, so I spent a lot of time actually studying bees. And uh, a really big focus for our organization is the conservation of pollinators. 
And that is because they are very important to our planet and also to us. This is one of my favorite visuals. Uh, it's several years old now, and you may have seen it circulate on the internet, uh, but I still show it because I think it's very powerful. On the left, it shows a produce section in a world uh, that has bees, and on the right is a produce section in a world that has no bees. And the bottom line here is if you like fruits and vegetables, you should be thankful for bees uh, because they pollinate many of those foods. They're not the only pollinators, but they do the lion's share of the work. About a third of the world's food supply is in fact pollination dependent, and that very specifically means animal vectored pollination. So that is an animal, oftentimes a bee, that brings pollen from one flower to another flower, which results in fruit or seed set. And to the U.S. economy, uh, pollinators contribute something on the, the estimates vary, but it's something on the order of hundreds of billions of dollars every year in the U.S. alone. But I also want to emphasize, we, I, we tend in, in conservation to talk about the sort of human-centered reason why we should care about pollinators, which is that our food depends on them, but their value is really so much greater than that. 80% of the plants on Earth are flowering and require some level of pollination to survive. Uh, pollinators are called keystone species because they're ecologically connected to many species in an ecosystem. If you think about it, uh, you know, they're not just pollinating our garden plants and our food plants, but they're pollinating plants that are part of aquatic e ecosystems. They're, they're pollinating flowering trees. They're pollinating plants that give food to other wildlife. Um, they are the glue kind of holding our ecosystems together, and in many ways they are responsible for life on Earth as we know it, and you can't put a dollar value on that. So when I ask people to think of a bee, most people will say the honeybee. And that is totally understandable. They're sort of held up as the poster child for bees. If we think about bees, we think of them being social. There's a bee movie <laughs> with Jerry Seinfeld in it. And, um, and we think about you know, honey production, right? That's what we think of when we think of bees. But uh, honeybees are actually not native to North America. They were brought here hundreds of years ago by European colonists for the purpose of having honey. Um, and since that time, they, you know, there are some wild colonies, but they're mostly a managed domesticated species that is maintained by humans. Um, and funny enough, most of our bees are actually not very like honeybees. We have many, many native species. So in the world, there are about 20,000 known species of bees. In North America, there are 4,000. And right here in New England, we have 400 species of bees. And as I said, many of them are not at all like honeybees. In fact, 90% of our bees are solitary. That means there's one female who is gathering food and bringing it back for her offspring, and she has no workers. They are not social. So in fact, most of our bees are, are nothing like honeybees. Um, that, that's not true for all of them. Some of them are social. And there are many different kinds of bees. It's an incredible diversity. I'm just gonna, this is just like a smattering of what's out there. These are just some of the families that are, uh, that are within the group that is bees. Uh, one is Helictidae. These are sweat bees, incredibly large and diverse family of bees. You can see that they all look very different even from each other. We have minor bees, which is Andrenidae. We have leaf cutter bees and mason bees, which is part of Megachylidae. We have Calididae, which are cellophane bees. We're gonna talk more about them. And then the bees that most people are familiar with tend to fall in this family, Apidae, that includes honeybees, um, and also these native species, which include bumblebees and carpenter bees, which are ones that folks may also be familiar with. All right, so this talk is gonna be mostly about bees, because that's my area of expertise, and because they also perform the lion's share of pollination in agricultural systems as well as natural systems. Um, but there are many other pollinators I just wanna point out. One of my favorites is bumblebees. Bumblebees are among the most important pollinators in temperate ecosystems. And this is because they have very fuzzy bodies, so they're really good at moving pollen around the landscape. Um, they are, in many cases, actually more effective crop pollinators than honeybees are. And for some species, like a tomato plant, honeybees actually are terrible pollinators, and bumblebees are very good ones. And this is in part because they perform this uh, behavior, which is called sonication, or buzz pollination where it literally vibrates its body to shake the pollen out of the pollen-bearing structures of the flower. 
And honeybees actually do not perform that behavior. Only, honey, only bumblebees and some other native species do it. So these flowers can literally only be pollinated by something like a bumblebee. It's very cool. You see, she, got, she shook it all up. She got it all over herself. She's having a great time. <laughs> Bumblebees are social. So these, this is our kind of, these are our social native species. And they're not just one species. There are many species of bumblebee. There are about 50 in, the, in, the, in North America. And in your backyard, you probably would have found more at an earlier time. Um, but now you'd probably find maybe, maybe five, and if you're lucky, maybe seven different species um, that are hanging around. And they have an annual life cycle. So again, they are social, but they're also not quite like honeybees. Honeybees have perennial colonies. They overwinter. The queen can live multiple years. In bumblebees, the queen lives one calendar year, and the colony is only there seasonally. So a queen will come out of hibernation in the spring. She then founds a colony, usually in an old rodent hole. They're cavity nesters. And then she has this solitary part of her life where she is alone is responsible for gathering food and provisioning her nest. Then at some point, you know, her initial brood will hatch, and that's her, those are her first daughter workers. And they will sort of take over the responsibility of bringing food back to the colony, and the queen will stop leaving, and she'll just start laying eggs. And that worker population builds and builds until a point where the whole colony decides, collectively, to switch to reproduction, where they make new queens and new males, those individuals go forth, they mate, and then everyone dies, <laughs> except for the mated queens who begin the cycle anew. So it's not quite the same as honeybees, where they have a queen that like branches off with a whole swarm. She always has an entourage. These queens are not like that. And this is just to give you a sense for what a bumblebee colony is like. So when you think about a honeybee colony, you may picture those perfect hexagons that honeybees make, right? Bumblebees are not like that. And they are more haphazard in how they construct their nests, which I personally appreciate. <laughs> um, and what you're seeing here, this is actually the queen. She's larger than the other bees. And this that she's sitting on is um, uh, an egg cluster. So inside of this wax is uh, a set of eggs that will then turn into larvae. And then if you can see these lumps right here, these are developing larvae that eventually become pupae, and then will ev eventually emerge as adult bees. And they're very industrious and, and clever, so these are all old pupil casings down here that they then turn into pots to store their, their nectar. Um, so, uh, as I said, bumblebees are social, they're cavity nesters, um, but the majority of our bees, again, are solitary. 70% of those bees live in the ground. They're ground nesting bees. And this is the sort of typical life cycle of one of those kinds of bees. They will make a little hole, some kind of nest in the ground that they dig out. They're, it's not a pre-existing hole. Um, they will bring pollen to the nest. She will. She'll lay an egg on it. That larva then grows um, over the course of time. And then it turns into a pupa and overwinters, and then comes out as an adult in the spring. So the, the uh, mother and the offspring actually never meet as adults. They're completely separated. Um, I know, it's interesting. So that's a, that's a typical life cycle. Sometimes they'll overwinter in other stages of development, but usually it's pupil. Uh, you've probably, if you haven't noticed ground nesting bees before, uh, maybe you will now, when you are out and about, they're con they tend to nest in congregations. This is not because they want to hang out with each other necessarily, but because they all like the same kind of soil. Uh, they tend to like sandier, sort of well-draining soils, because as you, as you might imagine, they don't want their nests to be flooded. Um, and so when you see these around the park, I see them a lot actually at Forest River in Salem. They're kind of these mounds, and you might mistake them for ant hills, but the holes are a little bit bigger. And if you watch for long enough, you will see a bee coming back and forth. This is a female that's poking her cute little head out. She's so cute. So we mentioned that there are minor bees. Minor bees uh, are among these ground nesting bees, and they make these long, impressive channels in the ground. And they create these offshoots, which is where they're housing their eggs and uh, their larvae and where they're growing over time. 
And minor bees are very interesting because 40% of them, for whatever reason, are specialists. And that means that they only forage on a select suite of plants. So these are just some examples. There's a willow specialist that literally only eats from willows. There's a sunflower specialist, which will only eat plants that belong to the sunflower family. This one is even more specialized. It will only feed from uh, uh, native geranium species. And then this one is a mustard specialist. So it will forage on plants that are in the mustard family. And even if they're not specialists per se, other species in this family um, still tend to have very strong preferences. So there's something called the cherry minor bee in our area, which uh, is frequently found on wild cherry trees. And it's not technically a specialist, but it, it does have strong preferences. And I bring this up because, as you know, we'll learn from Cheryl later about, about planting, what you plant really matters, especially for these bees. Some of them are generalists. They'll eat, you know, whatever. That's kind of how I eat. Um, but these are very, very picky. Um, and so if you don't have the right plants in the ecosystem, they're not going to be there. Uh, another specialist bee it, that's one of my favorite. I keep saying they're my favorites because they're like kind of all my favorites. Um, <laughs> but that's the squash bee. They're very cute, as you can see. Um, this, is a, this is very specialized. So these bees will only forage um, on cucurbits, on, on plants that are in the squash family. And they kind of, their whole life is around squash. So they'll nest under the leaves of the squash. That's where they're making their nest. The males will sleep in the flowers at night. It's like super cute. I know, it's so cute. Um, and they will only feed from the pollen and nectar of squash plants. Uh, and if you have squash, you may have mistaken these guys for, um, for honeybees because they have some very similar coloration. But if you look a little more carefully, their bodies are much fuzzier. Um, and they have kind of this gray and white striping on the back, which you can't see very well right there. So the next time you're out with, at a squash plant, um, like this summer, just stand there for a little while and I, I bet you'll see them. And we have so many kinds of bees. I can't possibly talk about them all in this talk, but I just want to point out some other ones that you might see in your garden. Um, this one is called the bicolored sweat bee. I have some examples in uh, the boxes that are back there if you want to look afterward. And they are this brilliant metallic green uh, with stripes. And there are other metallic green bees as well. They are amazing. Um, and some, you may not have even known that they were bees, but, uh, but they are. It's a whole group of sweat bees. Longhorned bees, um, you might understand why they're called that. They have these incredibly long antennae. They're also very cute. Uh, Ceratina are kind of, a, they have this like metallic bluish color. Assuredly, you'll see them in your garden over the summer. They are stem nesters, so they'll burrow into the, the pith of an old stem, and that's where they're making their nest. Uh, they're very small, and in fact, they're most closely related to carpenter bees, which is funny because they're so huge and these are so small, but they both do the same behavior of like, you know, boring out wood. Uh, and then these are another kind of metallic -y bee. They tend to be more green than brown, although this, this one's more brown, um, and that belongs to a group called Augaclora. So these are just some of the bees that you will see, but I hope it just demonstrates the incredible diversity of bees that are actually out there. All right, we're going to talk just uh, briefly about cellophane bees. This, this cutie poking her head out um, is, is a ground nesting bee. And they get their name because of the way that they nest. So they do this incredible thing. They make a biofilm. They themselves, they, they produce this biofilm that is very cellophane-like in composition. And they line their nest with it. And they do that to waterproof the nest so it doesn't get flooded out. And unlike those other bees that dig this channel and have kind of these offshoots, this bee lays their eggs sequentially. So they start at the back, they make a cell out of this cellophane material, they bring pollen, they lay an egg, they cap it off. And then they do the same thing, they make sequential cells uh, throughout the nest. And you can see you know, here the sort of pollen that's in this little cell, and then if you look carefully, these are the developing larvae, the baby bees in here. The baby bees look nothing like the big bees. <laughs> I think they're cute, but I understand if you don't think that. <laughs> OK, so 70% of our bees are ground nesting bees. And you'll see them in those kind of congregations. You'll see them in those little holes in the ground. The other 30% of our bees are above ground cavity nesters. 
And this is the typical life cycle of a cavity nesting bee. It's very similar where uh, in some kind of cavity, like a, like a hole in wood or an old stem most likely, there's going to be a pupa that's there from the winter. It emerges in the spring as an adult. They mate. The female then creates and provisions a nest. She also does this sequential structure. They almost all do, um, where they have start at the back and then move forward. And then those will turn into pupae and come out the following year. So again, the, the mother actually never meets the offspring as, as an adult. They're, they're separated in time. Uh, and this is just an example. This is man-made, but uh, you may have seen these around. They're becoming pretty popular. Uh, this is a, a, a bee hotel, some people call it. I do have opinions about these if anyone wants to ask. Um, <laughs> uh, and, uh, but it gives you a sense for the kind of like, size of the, of the natural stem that they might be nesting in in, the, in nature. What's your opinion? What? What is your opinion? Oh. <laughs> um, well, if you're going to keep them, you should make sure that they're very clean. Uh, because you can actually, they can spread disease if you don't, if you don't maintain them well. Um, so if you're committed to it, like do it, but if you're going to leave it out and not really take care of it, it's actually, it could cause more damage than good. So that's, that's my little spiel about that. So would you replace it every year? Uh, you replace the, so you either have to be able to clean out the stems, the, the tubes, or um, you have to replace them. Okay. Yeah. I, I have more details about that too. I know. I'll, yeah, I was just thinking. Presumably, you can learn about the plants that you would want to plant. Yes. To track the bees. And yes. Nature takes care of it for you. Yes. yes. Yeah. yeah. If you leave stems at the end of the season, yeah, she's going to talk about that. Yeah. Then, yeah. then yes, you're creating habitat without having to buy yeah. anything. They are pretty though. Okay, so these are some of our other cavity nesters above ground. Um, and this is just showing you a cross-section of the nest and the, the really cool things that they line their nests with. So leafcutter bees are cutting those leaves in order to take them back to the nest and build their nest out of them. So they're creating this lining of their nest, and then they're also capping off the cells with some combination of secretions and, and leaf. Um, resin bees, which are closely related, are doing the same thing, but they're gathering natural resins from plants. Um, you can see that kind of hardened right here. And then mason bees get their name from the fact that they use mud to construct their nests. And they're all very similar, but they're just using completely different materials. So if you're in your garden and you start to notice that there's like pieces of your leaf missing, if you're noticing it's kind of like a jagged edge or uh, the, the there are like little holes in it. That's a different kind of herbivory. If you see these perfectly round circles sort of cut out of the leaves, it means you have a leaf cutter that's coming to your garden and taking some pieces of leaf for its nest. What's their preference? Well, um, they like legumes, so like they'll cut it from like alfalfa. I've seen them do it from snap peas, uh, but they will take it from other plants as well. And it might be somewhat spe species specific how, how um, uh, how specialized they are and what they'll gather. And this just gives you a sense for what that's like. They have these really cool, like, bigger jaws, and they use them almost like scissors to cut out these leaf pieces. And think about how many times she used to go back and forth to do this. It's a lot of work. <laughs> Like, I think laundry is hard, but this is what <laughs> So she's going to cut it. Do it. Do it. OK. But then, and then you can't see that part, but she actually, she like rolls it up and carries it with her front legs all the way back to the nest and then starts tucking it in the way that she wants it. And she has to do that over and over and over again um, throughout the season. Uh, before I move on into some of the threats that uh, are facing pollinators, I did want to acknowledge the many other pollinators that are out there. Yes, bees are performing the lion's share of the work, um, but I want to acknowledge that flies are also important pollinators. This is a surfid fly. Wasps can be pollinators. I know folks don't always want to hear that, but they, they can be, and they're also important garden predators. Uh, moths 
butterflies, sometimes even beetles, and birds like the ruby-throated uh, hummingbird are all pollinators. So it's not just bees that are out there, and we really need them all to maintain the ecosystems that we have. Oh yeah, big shout out to flies. So uh, we don't have these here, obviously, because chocolate grows, grows in the tr tropics, but I did want to point out that chocolate is entirely brought to you by flies. If you like chocolate, you should feel this way about flies. <laughs> This is called the chocolate midge. It is actually the only pollinator of chocolate. It has a very complex flower, and it's, it, it's small. It's, like on the, it's one to three millimeters in length. And it can work its way into the, the complex flower to actually get pollen on itself and then transfer it to another uh, flower. And that has to happen. Uh, chocolate, cacao trees cannot pollinate themselves. So you should thank the chocolate midge. Okay. Um, so whether it's bees or any of these other pollinators, unfortunately there are many threats to their populations. And if you've heard that bees are in trouble or in decline, it's a, you know, there's nuance around that, but the overall message is yes, that is happening. We are losing bee diversity and we may be lo losing overall bee abundance. Uh, and that is for a variety of reasons, including invasive species, climate change, disease, uh, habitat loss and degradation, and pesticides. And I could literally give a talk on each of these <laughs> itself, so I'm just going to briefly touch on two of them that I think we have the most control over. The first one is pesticides. If you're going to plant a pollinator garden, it is antithetical to then use pesticides. Um, the habitat is really important. That habitat also needs to be clean for those bees that are coming. And one of the reasons for this is a lot of pesticides have, are systemic. So you may have heard of neonicotinoids that that's ha, has come up in the news. Neonicotinoids are a class of pesticides that are nicotine-like in structure. Um, and they have uh, d like ballooned in use since they went on the market in the 1990s. These are systemic. So if you do a soil drench or if it's even on the seed, that chemical is getting absorbed into the plant and it is expressed in all tissues of the plant, including the pollen and the nectar. So it is unavoidable for a bee in a landscape full of contaminated plants to avoid being uh, exposed to these, to these chemicals. And neonicotinoids are not the only ones that are systemic in nature. Um, so I just wanted to uh, point this out. You actually cannot purchase neonics off the shelf anymore as a consumer in Massachusetts, but licensed pesticide applicators can still use them. Um, so it's, it's, they're, not, they're certainly not gone, they're, and they're used in agriculture. So it's incremental progress, um, but I would say not enough. And then finally, habitat loss. We've converted a lot of natural land to uh, things that are not natural land. Uh, impervious surface, you know, in this area, probably the, the major habitat loss uh, conversion is from natural habitat to, to urban habitat, residential. So this is a sad place for bees. There's no, there's no food or place to nest. But I would argue that this is just as sad for bees. <laughs> this is a lawn that's mowed. There's nothing in it. Maybe there's a little bit of like wooded area over here. Maybe it's treated with a lot of chemicals to keep it nice and green. This is, this is not a hospitable habitat for bees. So when we talk about habitat loss, we're not just talking about buildings, we're also talking about how we take care of the land that we're on. Rosemary, quick. Yeah. I think it's mine, actually, so I'll go get that. <laughs> yeah. I was like, that's my car. Uh, I have my keys over here, but Cheryl's about to take over, so we're just going to stick through it. Okay. Anyway, so the solution, in addition to keeping your garden free of pesticides, is to plant more plants for pollinators, and that's where uh, Cheryl comes in because she does amazing things to actually put these plants on the landscape and that is what's going to keep our bees healthy in our, in our neighborhoods. Thanks. This is an adorable slide. This is the first time I'm seeing it. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so um, I'm Cheryl Rafuse. I run uh, an eco-conscious gardening company called Plant Magic Gardens. My office is here in Beverly. Um, and 
I, oh, I need the little doohickey. Rosemary. Oh, here it is. All right, got it. So, um, all right. So before we get to that, um, this is going to be like the DIY section. So um, if you can hold your questions until the end, you can ask all, all the questions you want of Roseberry and I. Um, but just so we can like kind of keep rolling. Um, we are going to talk about the way to carve out a garden bed. So ultimately, a lot of people are starting from scratch, right? Like you're starting, you've you moved into a new property or you're finally like, did all of the stuff you have to do the house now you can move to the outside um uh so you're gonna probably be carving out either grass or turning kind of you know a 1950s landscape that's been leaf blown for years into something valuable for pollinators so the hard way but cheap way um is to use a long handled edger cut out squares of grass flip them over cover it with mulch I actually find that to be um, a lot easier if you are willing to rent a sod cutter from Home Depot and you can just literally roll through, pull like a strip of grass up and then flip it over. The reason why I say flip it over and instead of like, you know, taking the sod to the Beverly compost is because a lot of nutrients are in that top layer. So by flipping the grass, you're actually utilizing the nutrients in the grass itself. And that, that thin little piece of dirt that's with it actually has a bunch of nutrients as well. So that's why I like doing it this way. It's, I call it the hard way, but it's also just easier than trucking all your sod out. Um, the really easy way is to get chip drop. Who here's heard of chip drop? Some folks. So chip drop is this, um, a website that kind of connects you with local arborists that have to get rid of their chips anyway. The one downside is you don't know where these chips are coming from. You know, they could chop up a bunch of bittersweet and put it on, on your lawn, but it's free. Um, and a lot of times it is just, you know, it's, it could be native cherry trees. It could be uh, Norway maple. It doesn't really matter what tree it is. Um, sometimes you can talk to the arborist too and like, you know, figure it out. But you get a whole, you know, two yards dropped and you thickly layer the chips anywhere you want to garden. And then you just wait, which is a heck of a lot easier than digging up a bunch of sod. Um, you'd be surprised how quickly just a layer of wood chips can change the consistency and the texture of your soil while it degrades. This is an edger. Um, I've had enough people ask that I, I, I just put it up on its own slide. Um, so... This edger, you literally just, you know, use it kind of like a shovel and you can create little squares. You can create squares as tiny as you want, especially if you're starting with a really small area and just flip all those little squares over. And it, it honestly, it's, it's not, it's not as hard as it sounds. This is the chip drop site. It's really easy. And there's an app too. So especially if you're like, I want to redo my entire yard and I'm on a really strict budget, this is going to be your friend. So good plants for bees. Um, this is smooth beard tongue, uh, Penstemon digitalis is, and all of these are easily accessible. So these aren't plants that you like, you know, have to go to Prairie Moon Nursery, although Prairie Moon Nursery's website is a great place to get seeds and plants. You can a lot of times find these at local nurseries. Now, as Rosemary had said about the neonicotinoids, you do want to ask like, hey, can you tell me? has this come from a place where they've used neonicotinoids? A lot of times they don't know. Sometimes you're taking a risk if you get it from just like your average um, like nursery. Um, and if that's something that you're worried about, what I recommend is going with one of our local um, uh, native plant folks like the Monarch Gardener or Oak Haven Sanctuary in Reading. Um, I also have like a big map um, in here somewhere of a bunch of different ones. Butterfly weed is another one. Um, and I like this one because it's kind of double duty. It does, uh, it's a host plant for monarchs and it's really, really good for like leaf cutter and sweat bees. Um, it's a pretty one. Um, the wild bergamot, also a fave. Um, this one uh, is also good because bunnies don't tend to eat it because the bergamot is, you know, it's, it's scented. So the bunnies, you know, as that, as we all know, it's a huge problem in this area. Um, and I, I tried to list on every single one of these kind of the, the loose groups of bees that are benef that are benefited by these plants. 
Um, the golden alexander, this is kind of a powerhouse of a plant for pollinators. Um, the uh, swallowtail butterfly also loves this plant, so good for bees, good for butterflies, always a good one. Um, so now we're going to move into some of the shade plants. Uh, the large-leaved aster, um, this one's a really hardy aster too. Um, I've had this one get nibbled by bunnies and it still comes back. Um, sweat bees, bumblebees, mining bees, um, and this blooms late in the f uh, summer fall too. It's one of the last food sources for pollinators. So asters are kind of funny because a lot of people will pull them because they think they're weeds because they stay leaf, just little leaves for most of the season. So you'll think, oh, like this hasn't bloomed all year, I'm just gonna pull it. Wait until something flowers before you pull it. And that means waiting until like September because <laughs> um, some of these asters bloom super late. So if, you know, if your app is saying it's an aster, but you're like, I've never seen flowers on it, it might be because it's getting, like you're pulling them too early. Um, and it is worth kind of like looking up like, you know, large leaved aster, seedling and a lot of times google will just pop up with like what that looks like and then you can compare um what that what that might be um now this is our native geranium so those bees that are geranium specific they are going to be using this as their main source of food um the uh geranium maculatum grows really really well in gardens um it's technically good for part shade, but I actually have it in some full sun gardens. And as long as those gardens are really moist, they actually do pretty well. So um, I would love to see this plant also used in, you know, if you've got parts of your yard that you're kind of like, doesn't really need to be a garden. I don't really want it to be lawn. It doesn't get stepped on a lot. It can be a really pretty ground cover. It gets like, you know, about this tall. Um, so that's, that's a really nice one. Plus it's like, you know, really pretty pink. Um, this is one of my favorite ground covers. Um, this is not like the Japanese anemone. It tends to spread and form a mat very quickly. Um, I love that about it. If you have a garden where you're like, I really can't have things spreading and going crazy, don't plant this. Um, but the flowers are gorgeous. They're cute, they're little, um, and it benefits a lot of different bees. So when you're planting any of these, you really do have to prepare the, you know, you'll, you'll pull it out of a pot, right? And you've got your, your pot shaped plant. And a lot of times, um, these plants have been sitting on a, um, like nursery floor for a while. So you'll have that big, like, but I call it plant butts because I think it's funny because we deal with them all the time. Um, but yeah, so you really want to be ripping off that bottom bit of roots. It can feel really scary because especially if you're like houseplant people, you have to be really gentle with the roots of houseplants. Not so for perennials. You want to rip off the bottom. You want to muss up the sides of the plant, um, that root ball, and then you put it in the ground and make sure that it's level with the ground too. If you plant too high, the plant could die because it um, could dry out more quickly. And if you plant it too low, you could get stem rot. So you want to make sure that wherever the soil was, when you put it out, take it out of the pot, make sure that it's at the same level when you put it in the ground. Good mulch makes a good garden. Um, a lot of people are like, I can't grow anything on my property. And I'm like, it's probably just that your soil's been depleted, especially if you're creating gardens on spots that were lawn. So lawns end up being watered and watered and watered. And that's why we have to fertilize them, fertilize them, fertilize them, because we're just you know, draining nutrients out of them consistently. So if you've done the whole, you know, carved out the lawn and put, you know, whatever mulch, from whatever nursery without doing a lot of research. Um, sometimes there's not enough compost in it. So even if you do chip drop, sometimes there's not enough nutrients there because it's just wood chips. So if you're just starting a bed and you're really worried about the soil content, I use, um, in this area, we can get terra mulch. Um, you can get that if you need it in small quantities. You can just go to um, Wolf Hill and get it directly from them. Or you can get it from Brick Ends Farm, which is amazing. Um, if you've got a truck or something, you can like, just like load up the truck and head out. Or you can get it delivered and just dump like a big pile. Especially if you've got some neighbors that are doing it, you could get like a, you know, nice good mulch terra mulch is made from composted horse bedding so it's incredibly rich it still has the manure in it um occasionally it does still smell a little ammonia-y but it fades i promise um 
And um, it has changed so many gardens, like where I, I don't plant anything. I just do that mulch and people are like, oh my God, why does it look so good this year? It holds the moisture. It holds the moisture so that even during a terrible drought like we had two years ago, the gardens that I planted still did really well. If you are beholden to black wood mulch, stop. <laughs> it is really like sleek, but it, it bakes in the sun. It does not hold moisture. It doesn't regulate the soil temperature. Um, and as, as pretty as it is, um, you know, it, it really just doesn't do any of those things that mulch really should be doing. Um, now, if you're like, I, the whole brick ends thing seems expensive and like a lot of work, it's not that expensive, but if you're like really on a budget, just use leaves. If you're doing a native plant garden, um, you don't even necessarily have to chop them up. Chopping them up actually, you know, can destroy cocoons, um, of, you know, things like the lunar moth and things like that. So chopping isn't necessarily what I would do. Usually what I do is I rake all the leaves into the beds at the end of the year. And the next year we go, we tidy up a little bit, and then we just put like a thin layer of the terra mulch over the top. That way, if there's anything in those leaves, they'll kind of like get their way out of the leaves on their own. We haven't like destroyed them. Um, and the leaves can also act as nutrients for the soil. So, you know, if you're like, I want it to look nice, but I also want to use my leaves, totally add just like a little layer of mulch on top so that it, it looks like, you know, maybe you've, You've got like a really neat garden, but underneath it's all the, the leaves that uh, you grab from your neighbor's houses. <laughs> so these are some local native plant sources. Um, I love the Monarch Gardener. She also just got a new space, so she's going to be expanding. Um, she does a lot of the perennials. So um, like, you know, if you want that Monarda fistulosa bee bomb that I said was really good and that the bunnies don't eat. Um, and she's also really knowledgeable. So you're buying from someone who, if you're like, I really just want to support all the bees, she'll probably be able to point out a couple plants to you. She's just, she's amazing. I wish we could clone her and put her in every county. Um, Oak Haven Sanctuary in North Reading has a lot of shrubs. Um, and I actually was just talking to the guy who runs it, Walter, and he has put in a path around his property where you can actually look at a lot of the plants, like in situ. Um, and he's labeled a whole bunch of them. It's very cool. Um, little farther, but worth the trip, is Garden in the Woods in Framingham. Um, they have huge gardens um, that you can get inspiration from, and it's all native plants. And they also do plant sales. Um, if you want specific things, I recommend downloading their Excel sheet and doing like a proper order because stuff tends to sell out. Um, and then some of the local places that do have some native plants and are getting better um, are Corliss up in Ipswich. They're trying their best to get in more native plants. And the buyer for Wolf Hill in um, Ipswich is the one that I've talked to and he's like, I want tons more native plants next year. So he was kind of new last year um, and this year I think they're gonna have a lot more there. Cedar Rock and Gloucester. Cedar Rock and Gloucester is doing a ton of native plants too? They're, they're doing some. Some. There than other places. All right, great. So Cedar Rock and Gloucester is another one. Um, so I have this map um, that I was actually hoping maybe we could make this slideshow available um, if, if, if we can, because this link actually will bring you to this map um, right here. And it will have every single place, including you know places like Corliss and Cedar Rock that have a little section, um, every single place in the area that you can buy native plants from. It's crowdsourced from, I think, the Native Plants of the Northeast um, Facebook page um, or group. And it is, it's incredibly valuable. I send this to my DIY clients all the time. Now, if you're like, I'm not gonna be out there digging a bunch of holes, this all sounds really hard. Um, you can do a very easy mini meadow. Like if you've got one of those little postage stamp yards and you're like, I just want like a little section of it to have a bunch of flowers. So flipping or pulling the grass, like we talked about earlier, um, spreading a layer of compost. Now, a lot of times when you look up how to have a wildflower meadow or how to put in a meadow, everyone's going to be like, oh, they're native seeds. You don't need compost. You don't need soil amendments. This is true, but you're going to get way better germination if you just put like just a layer of compost. So if you're doing like a really little spot, you just need like a, one bag of compost. Just like flip the grass so that it dies. 
Um, you can even leave it for you know a couple days in the hot summer sun. Um, put the compost down and then spread your seeds and set up a sprinkler on a timer. Or if you're you know a reliable waterer and you can be sure to water every single day while the seeds are going to be germinating, um, just get out there and make sure those seeds stay damp. The thing about germination, seed germination, is that once seeds get damp, they want to stay damp. So that's why you got to be out there every single day. Um, and it's better to do like earlier in the spring, um, because that's, you know, that gives your plants plenty of time before the winter to really get situated, have their roots deep enough so they don't die over the winter. Um, and it also means you enjoy some plants a little earlier. Uh, so I usually say water daily until plants are mature, which is at least four inches tall. I, it's not like an exact science, um, but somewhere around there, you can usually start easing off on the watering every day. Because after that, if you keep watering every day, sometimes you can water over water and then you start rotting your plants. So at some point when you're like, these seem kind of happy, skip a day and see how it goes. If they look really wilty, keep watering <laughs> more often. <laughs> This is the sod cutter that I was talking about. If you are like major DIYer, figure out how to get one of these from Home Depot to your house. <laughs> um, you can rent little ramps. Um, we actually do this. We, we get rent their ramps too, and you pop it up into a truck and bring it to, um, to the job site. Um, and this makes pulling up all that sod a lot easier. Or you can hire us. It's okay. <laughs> So some good seed sources, Cape Ann Gardens is actually um, selling a bunch of native ecotypes on their website. Um, and Prairie Moon or Prairie Nursery also are very reliable for good seed quality for all the native plants that we talked about today. So I, I wanted to like really slam through that because I know we're running out of time. Um, but what questions do we have? Yes. I tried, I tried chip job, but it was like pre-pandemic, and no one ever came. Is it getting better in the area? Because I desperately need chips. Like, so you had luck, like recently. I, recently, oh, yes. Okay. I've had, I've had good luck recently with people getting chip drop. If um if for whatever reason this area is funky, try try directly calling an arborist and be like, hey, okay. do you get? Because they have to pay to get rid of their chips. With chip drop, it's free for them and it's free for you. So it's actually like a great deal. Um, I. I I'm I'm gonna guess that's because of the the pandemic. If yeah, it was like, like at first, no one I, I put it on and I tried again the next year, and then no, so I thought maybe like no one knew about it in the area and they weren't like doing it. Um, so in my I found out about it from my cousins in California who use it all the time. Yeah, um, I'm I'm gonna guess that chip drop is more common these days because yeah. um, I have a lot of clients who use it actually. Um, uh, all right, right here. Yes, the difference between compost and mulch and when to use one and when to use the other. Yes, so compost is, um, it, it's like black earth compost. It's like you take a bunch of food scraps and, you know, they, I think they even have like some fish guts that they get from Gloucester and like all kinds of things, coffee grounds. You know, you turn them uh, in like a pile and let it get really hot and degrade. Um, and then you get all these like really good nutrients in this like, like literal black gold. Um, and you put that down and it is good for nutrients. I know some people use it as a mulch. Um, I try not to do that because a lot of my clients are adjacent to, um, for lack of a better word, like weed making factories where it's just like dandelion seeds and all kinds of stuff. And if those land on compost, they're going to germinate really easily. Um, so I tend not to use it as a mulch. Um, I like using um, terra mulch because it kind of does both with the, the shavings from the horse bedding and the manure in it, it kind of acts as a little bit of compost and a little bit of a weed barrier at the same time. Um, the, the only times that I use wood mulch are when people use chip drop or we're trying to create like a path with playground mulch or something like that. I really don't use a lot of wood mulch at all um, because native plants actually are in this area adjusted to leaves being their mulch, like a rich humus being their mulch, which is why if you've planted a bunch of native plants and you're like, I know they drop their seeds, but like I don't have any seedlings anywhere. If they're all dropping onto like a big pile of wood, they're not gonna germinate well. 
So the terra mulch is like honestly one of the best things I've found that works both as a mulch and as a compost. Um, does that answer your question? I feel like I talked around it a lot. <laughs> All right, good. And then we had one up here. Two quick questions. My son's lawn has a lot of oak trees. Will that impact doing this kind of stuff? And secondly, can I do any of this in containers? You can definitely do this in containers, number one. Like, um, so the question was, can I do native plants in containers? Um, yes, um, you can even do a little bit of meadow seed in a container. Um, the, the fun thing with containers is that if you're able to kind of insulate them over the winter somehow, or just plant plants that are, you know, hardy even to, like, so we're like zone 6B, um, so if you get plants that are hardier to zone five, you're more likely to have them get through the winter when it gets really cold. Cause if they're in a container, unless that container is like walled and insulated, sometimes the roots will die over the winter and then you'll have to replant them anyway. So you could wrap it, you could put it in a corner and throw all your leaves in that corner with like, you know, a burlap over it or something. Um, cause you still want it to get like some moisture. Um, but you definitely like some people are like, Oh, I put my whole container in the garage, but then like it doesn't get any moisture. So sometimes those plants dry out and die. Um, and then, um, if they're native oak trees, what I would look into is something called soft landings, um, which is planting companion plants to the native oak tree. So plants like, you know, ferns, asters, columbine, um, things that are, are generally found growing with oak trees are going to always do well under the oak trees kind of thing. Well, if you've got an area that gets at least six hours of sun, you could potentially plant meadow mix. Where is sunny? Yeah, that would that would be where I would put my meadow is is right over there. Have it be all your like heavy hitter sunny pollinator plants, and then the shady portion of this. Um, I mean, there's tons more shade plants you can definitely plant. Um, this is like a smattering um, that are very bee specific. Uh, but what I would say is. Um, using using the, like a terra mulch or a rich mulch or even even just using compost to kind of break up the soil a little bit because um, what happens is the oak trees are going to be sucking up all as much moisture as they possibly can so looking for like dry shade plants is probably your best bet um, because any trees like that that maybe have been leaf blown underneath aren't going to have as much compost in the soil naturally so you either have to like add it back somehow or just use plants that are adapted to that kind of space does that make sense yes. cool so we had two random milkweed plants next to the chain link fence last year nice and we got monarchs yeah yeah they'll honestly the bees and the butterflies will find the plants we will show up on a property that has zero native plants we've taken out the invasives and now it's just kind of like a blank slate we'll like take the plants off the truck and put them on the ground and suddenly there's a milkweed beetle <laughs> on them and i'm like how did you get here <laughs> um like I, they, they it's shocking how fast they find the native plants um i i know that people didn't also didn't have time to maybe ask rosemary questions too so if you do have questions for rosemary as well feel free to lob them at us So um, I like the idea of being able to like supplement your garden. So if you have like a lot of people have use in their front uh, foundation bed, um, those can act as really good places for birds to hide and nest and do that kind of thing. A lot of times they're Japanese use, so they're non-native. But what is under the use? Like, do you have room for a native ground cover? Um, can you kind of supplement those non-native plants? Um, one of the things that um, I thought that I had in here, but I think I might have taken it out because I was worried it would take too much time, is um, cutting your stems um, around now for those stem nesting bees. So even if you do have something non-native, if you have a stem that is hollow, um, instead of, you know, maybe you're, you have ornamental grasses or something that are non-native, instead of just cutting them like, you know, real, real short, um, cut them like 10 to 12 inches tall 
so that those stems are a little bit higher off the ground. Um, you're much more likely to get those stem nesting bees. Ultimately, they are going to be more attracted to native grasses and native stems just because they fit their needs better. Um, but that's another way that you can do that. Um, and also just using, like, you know, not using herbicides, not using pesticides. Um, there's a garden that we're doing in Gloucester that was planted to be like very like Japanese garden chic and has a beautiful weeping cherry. It's got like a huge Japanese maple. Neither of these are plants that I like to plant. However, I'm not going to like walk onto a property and be like, these got to go. Um, they're huge. You know, we're not going to take them out. They're part of what's creating a decent amount of shade. Um, so instead what we did is we found a bunch of native plants that kind of complement that vibe and are adding them in in the empty spaces. Um, also, when an uh, invasive or non-native plant dies, you can instead replace it with a native plant instead of just putting in like, you know, say you have an endless summer hydrangea that's just been struggling ever since you put it in, just take it out, put in an oak leaf hydrangea instead. That's a native hydrangea. All right, photographer. <laughs> Uh, so you, you you actually sort of maybe glossed over uh, the fertilizer section about the seaweed. Can you, can you talk oh yeah. About how, how good is seaweed? Seaweed's great. And, okay. Yeah. So seaweed is actually um, the main one of the main ingredients for the Neptune's harvest that's made up in Gloucester. Um, we use that on a lot of roses. Um, it's re a really great, easy way to add nutrients back to your soil. Um, I know that there are some people on the coast, like coast coast, like living on the beach kind of thing, who will use seaweed as mulch. Only do that if you have plants that are salt tolerant, because that seaweed is just filled with salt water. So plants like Clethra alnifolia or seagrass and things like that can handle that level of salinity. But you, you, you can't, like, I, I probably wouldn't just, like, casually put it on, like, a garden, like, over here, um, unless I knew that those plants were... How about, how about late fall or winter? In what? I don't know. Just, so, like, just where, when it's been, like, rinsed by the rain? Yeah. Um, I think if you are able to take the seaweed out of its natural environment, kind of, like, lay it out and let it you know, get rained on and stuff. Yeah, I think that's probably a good way to do it. But you still are going to end up with like some level of salinity. So like, I'd be worried about burning plants that aren't salt tolerant. As um, the um, Neptune's Harvest um, seaweed liquid fertilizer has been, you know, desalinated or whatever. Um, so that stuff is fine for use on everything. Um, but yeah, I think that's what I would be careful about. I don't do it personally, so it might be worth kind of like poking around a little bit um, just to confirm. <laughs> um, right here. Cat proof? Yeah, so the cat doesn't like, you know. Use it as a litter box? Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, I gotta be honest, uh, controlling cats is pretty hard. Um, I've got a couple clients who have, you know, the neighbor's cat keeps coming over here. Um, short of fencing it off, it's really, really difficult to keep a cat out. And even if you fence it off, the cat could probably just climb it and get in there anyway. Um, so, I mean, if it's your cat and you let it out, um, if I'm going to be honest, I prefer to keep all cats inside because any outdoor cats that aren't kept on a leash affect our songbird population immensely. Um, they eat our songbirds, they eat chipmunks, they eat all of our native species. Um, I actually consider outdoor cats an invasive species, which is not something a lot of people want to hear. Yep, yep. So, so if, if you're able to keep them indoors, that's number one. If it's one of those cats that's like it's impossible, um, you just kind of have to be careful when you're gardening and keep your poop bags on you. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I wish I had a better solution for that. Um, back here. If there's time, uh, I, I think a lot of us in Beverly are dealing with Norway maples, which are yes. um, at least just beyond where we're trying to make things happen. So mm -hmm. um, do you have a solution to that, uh, short term or long term? 
So long term, what I tell people is if you have like a backyard full of Norway maples, um, maybe taking down a couple to make room for native trees. Because what you don't want to do is if you move into a house, right, and you have seven Norway maples in the back, they're storing carbon, even though they're in, in, just in case people don't know, Norway maples are an invasive tree. They are everywhere and they don't support our um, ecosystem the way that our sugar maples do or any of our other maples. So ultimately you move into a property, right? You've got like eight Norway maples in the back and they're the only trees you have. I would not recommend actually going back there and just chopping all of them down. Number one, you now have no shade. Um, number two, uh, they actually do store carbon, um, which is really valuable. Uh, and when you chop trees down and then they end up burned, the carbon just ends up released into the atmosphere. So what I would always recommend is maybe take down uh, enough so that you can plant some native trees. And then when those trees have reached a size where you're like, okay, I do have some shade now, that's when you can. So it's definitely like a long term thing if you have a whole bunch of them. If you have, you know, a pretty nice garden couple different native trees and like one Norway maple, chop that sucker down, get it out of there. Um, and then if you are like, it's not my choice, I rent, I cannot take this Norway maple down. Um, ultimately planting native plants around a Norway maple and mulching and composting with some really rich stuff is what's going to help you because the reason why people say I can't plant anything underneath my Norway maple, I think it's a lullopathic. It might be somewhat, but really what's happening is the Norway maple is just sucking all of the water out of the soil. So being able to have a really good mulch on top of that garden is part of what's going to help those native plants thrive. Um, so we're at 2.06. Um, I, I don't know if we have a hard stop with the library or not. I'm happy to keep answering questions for, for another five minutes. Yeah. How about that? We don't have a hard stop. Uh, I mean, the library closes. Uh, all right all right cool cool but i know if, if people need to leave we won't we won't judge you um because it's after two but I have a few announcements at the end, so we could do those announcements. and then if people want to ask a couple more questions here i think you might need to speak into the mic right Wow, thank you guys so much. That's an amazing amount of knowledge. We'll stay to the five, right? <laughs> so thank you. So I wanted to just um, list off a few things that Green Beverly is doing, and then these guys have an announcement too. So Green Beverly is going to be rolling out a pollinator sign this spring. So that will be um, available. The plan is for you to be able to purchase it. We're going to have a form so you could fill in like, hey, I got these seeds when I was at the library event. I'm starting my pollinator garden. Or, oh my gosh, I can fill out this entire questionnaire. I have 12,000 plants in my yard. I am a bona fide pollinator garden. So both will be available. So uh, one of the technical problems that I had is I don't think I got everybody's email address when you did that QR code. So technology is great when it's working, and then I somehow screwed it up. So if you really, really, really want to know when pollinator things are happening, please just stop by. And even if you did the QR code, just leave your name and your email address so we have it. So um, if you're on that list, you'll know when we have our pollinator signs out. Um, again, because of the generosity of cell signaling technology, the other part of this grant is that we're actually giving free plants away. So um, we're going to be giving away uh, about 90 kits. The kits are going to have three plants, native pollinator plants, that actually I'm buying from um, Ipswich Wolf Hill. Is that I said it right? Yeah. And um, then there's going to be a pollinator sign, and then the, actually the seeds that you just got are going to be part of that kit. It's going to be June 8th. We're going to be giving them away at Chapman Florist, and June 9th we're going to be giving them away at the trustee's property, the Long Hill property. So you'd be looking um, on our website for that information, and certainly make sure I have your email address, because then I'll just email you that information. Um, and then along with that uh, pollinator sign idea, we're rolling out a map. And I guess I already said that. I got confused what I was talking about. Um, so the pollinator sign, the map, and the form are all going to go together. So there'll be some information coming up where you can fill in the form, and um, then your property would actually show up on the map. 
And so then the idea is that we'll be able to look at a map of Beverly, see all the places that have things that our pollinators can eat, and then we can draw lines and show you how interconnected our little pollinators are. And so the last thing I have is last summer, Rosemary headed up a project and uh, with a grant that she had actually, and we planted a demonstration garden down at Dane Street Beach. It's around the flagpole. So take a look at that. They're definitely dormant right now. There's not much to see, um, but it's all coming. And I do have a funny Astro story that I do want to tell ever so quickly because I don't, I'm learning too. I don't know very much. So I helped rosemary plant. Actually, these guys helped plant too, right? I've been watering this thing. I go down there in fall and there's this beautiful purple flower. I'm like, what the heck? It's like fall. And I literally looked to see if somebody had, you know, like planted it, but it's this, Aster, which is it's phenomenal. So I'm really excited about Aster. So anyway, I just wanted to tell you about that. So when you're out for a walk, check out Dane Street Beach. We'll definitely be looking for people to help with that. So if you want to learn from the masters that are going to be there, or if you want to be part of the watering crew, you can talk to me as well. So lastly, Jordan and Alistair have a little announcement about what's happening in Rileside. And then after they do that announcement, we're going to do our raffles. So don't leave. <laughs> Thanks, Shelly. Really appreciate Shelly and the, the Green Beverly team for putting this together. Fantastic event. We are organizing a garden swap on Sunday, May 19th, over in Rileside. It'll be at Aubert Park. Uh, there are some flyers floating around. If you didn't get one, uh, see if you can borrow the QR code and scan it on your phone. It's also posted on the Green Beverly events page now if you want more information. Um, this is something that we did last year for the first time and had a lot of fun with it. Really grateful to Cheryl for coming out last year and speaking and for, to Green Beverly for being there. So we'll, we're really glad that they're both going to be coming back. Um, and I'm going to pass it to Alistair for a little bit of guidance on what we would love for you to bring, but really excited to see you all there. Thank you. Um, so we were trying not to be too picky about what people bring. You know, ideally we'd say, just bring native plants and we'll, we'll do it that way. What worked, I think, quite well last year was people can bring whatever, ideally pollinator or native plants or vegetables, fruit, whatever. Um, then we look over at Cheryl and notice where she's tutting. <laughs> <laughs> so, wherever she was tutting, we'd go up and go, yeah, that's invasive, just put it in the flat bag. Um, so we had different tables. We had one table was for native plants, one was for fruit and vegetable things you can eat, another was non-native pollinators that we quite like. Um, seemed to work really well. We've shortened the time, as Jordan says, it's going to be 10 to 11.30 a.m. this year. Ideally, if you are coming, come towards 10, then when we get the plants, we can get them set up for people. And then there's this mad rush where people take things. Um, and that, that's about it. And um, hope to see some of you there. Question. Is there a list of non-native pollinator friendlies to bring? <laughs> Like what qualifies? Like, I can answer that. <laughs> Do you want me to hop back on the mic there? Um, so the question was, is there a list of acceptable non-native plants? No. <laughs> but you can look at the official invasive plant list and see if your plant is on that list. Um, I also, you know, bring whatever, and then you, you know, I'm gonna be there, we can like point at stuff, like a lot of people love to bring Finca, because they're like, oh my god, I have so much, and it's like, there's a reason why you have so much, it's like super invasive. It's not technically on the invasive species list, but it really should be, um, so stuff like that, it's not hard and fast, um, especially because like, invasiveness um, decided by the state of Massachusetts isn't necessarily what science and my eyes in the forest actually um, are experiencing um, because the invasive plant uh, list is created by like one guy who runs Weston Nurseries and you know he's got a couple people who are able to go to different areas that people point out but ultimately he just has people like me and Mary Ellen Dixon is occasionally emailing him and being like, why isn't California pregnant on this list? Um, and he's like, I'm working on it. Like you have to have a certain amount of proof and you know, he's one guy. What about um, lilacs? Lilacs are non-native, yeah. but generally they don't spread like a lot of other things. These like 
Um, bees do like them, but the thing about, and I'm sure Rosemary will back me up on this, there are, are recent studies coming out on non-native flowers of perennials, shrubs, like lilac, where a lot of these plants, the nectar is not the right mix of like amino acids, fatty, whatever is, and I'm not smart enough to tell you exactly what it is, but um, the, the mix of everything, all those nutrients is not as good for our native insects as like say like a clethra on the folia summer sweet shrub, which still smells nice, it blooms in the summer, it's gorgeous, but it's not a lilac. Um, so it's not invasive, but if you're going to plant a lilac, I would say plant a clethra right next to it, <laughs> so that you can kind of... If I bring zinnia or salvia, what are you going to say to me? <laughs> <laughs> Should I back up? <laughs> so, so um, salvia is non-invasive. Zinnia is an annual, so I don't tend to worry about it as much. Um, annuals tend to not be a huge problem because they die in the winter anyway. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm not going to like... Like, I'll, I, when I tell my clients when I show up, I'm not going to like walk around and be like, really? Like, I'm not like doing that. Um, I, I know I'm here to educate. I know I'm here to um, inform. And I know that people have emotional attachments to plants. Like, specifically, Lily of the Valley, the scent of it. People are like, it reminds me of my grandmother. And I'm like, I know, it's actually really tasted it. I'm sorry. Um, but, you know, it, it's... I'm aware that this isn't just like a really easy like cut and dry thing where like you're gonna be like cool you told me it's a base I'm just gonna rip it out I will work on clients for several years to get them to rip it out um, but you know it's it is can be like a, like an emotional thing um, and we we know a lot more than we used to know about how these plants interact with our local ecosystems um, so you know I'm I'm not here to pass judgment. <laughs> yeah, I just want to ask if we're in doubt. You know, and there's a lot of words and Latin and, and a lot of things people do and ways to purchase. When in doubt, should we just bring what we have and learn about it that day? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So. Just for the BevCam people, because I just realized that you guys probably can't hear a darn thing. Um, this is a really, really good question. Um, ultimately. If you are wondering, is this plant invasive? It, like, I like this one, can I bring it home? Any of that stuff. Um, I, I'm happy to have people, you know, shoot our email a picture and I will literally just answer. Like, I'm, I might give you like a one word because we're really, really busy at this point and things are starting to ramp up, but I am absolutely fine like having you message me on Instagram and be like, you know, what is this invasive? Um, because it can be really difficult to figure out on your own. Because sometimes you're like, this could be one of three things because a lot of people don't have the, you know, insane person gene that I have when I can look at a, one little leaf and be like, oh, that's this. Like, it's fine. Not everybody has to know that. So bring whatever you've got to the plant swap um, in Rileside and we will figure it out together. Um, and it, it's, it's not something that like, you know, everyone's gonna learn overnight. Um, I hope that makes people feel a little better. It's fun. <laughs> and it is, it's really fun. Last year we had so much fun. Um, and you know, it's, it, it's okay. <laughs> I have a question about uh, the plant swap. There is some kind of worm that is... Yes. Yeah, and so how are you going to deal with that? So if you have jumping worms on your property um, and you are planning on coming to the plant swap, if you want to share plants, you have to root wash them, which means if you are going to pull them out of your, your garden, you cannot bring us any soil. Um, that means if you are going to split um, something like, uh, I don't know, like a little blue stem um, that tends to hold a lot of dirt in the roots, you really probably shouldn't bring it to the plant swap because ultimately um, the jumping worms, invasive jumping worms deplete soil and are really, really bad for our forests, um, which there actually aren't any native earthworms um, in this area, like essentially like north of the Mason-Dixon line where like all, it all used to be um, glacial. Um, anywhere in that area, uh, there are no native worms. So even the regular earthworms that you find are not technically native to here. 
Um, I know that they're good for, you know, vegetable gardens and stuff like that. I'm not telling you to go out and kill every worm you see. Um, <laughs> they've been here for a long time. But the jumping worms are such a problem that we actually, if we find them, we actually do kill them um, because they're, they're a real menace. Um, so it's a great point. Thank you for bringing it up. Either root wash or if you can't get all the dirt off of your plant, please don't bring it because you might infect someone's yard that doesn't have any jumping worms. So if you, you'll know, yeah, if you see um, some of the really um, easy ways, or if you've ever picked up a worm on your property and it starts like having a seizure um, and it feels really like weird and muscular, you have jumping worms. It's freaky. It's gross. Um, I hate them. Um, and they're honestly, almost every single one of our properties has jumping worms. They, they're pretty pervasive. I remember having them back in the 90s when I used to garden with my mom down on the South Shore, they're around. I think climate change is making them worse. 